My name is Chris Marquez. Um, I'm a principal in the San Diego office, and today my colleague Danielle Williams, who's a principal in Atlanta, is joining me. We're going to present um, uh, some topics concerning patent damages theories. The webinar is going to run for about an hour. Um, you can submit questions at any time by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. Uh, we'll do our best to answer all the questions at the end, um, time permitting, um, but we won't be taking them on the fly as, as the, uh, the presentation proceeds. Um, also, you know, if afterwards you, you have questions um, that did not get answered or something else pops up, please feel free to contact either me or Danielle personally by email or by telephone if, if you prefer to do that. Um, the presentation, our bios, and the New York, New Jersey CLE form are available for download in the handout pane of your control panel. You can download those at any time during the presentation. When you join today's webinar, you're selected to join either by phone or computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You'll have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters. You may also send in your questions at any other time, and we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session, as I mentioned, at the end of the presentation today. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. So moving along here, I want to mention um, before we get into the content of today's presentation that um, there will be a webinar coming up here very shortly, December 15, 2016, talking about the post-HALO issues and willful infringement. Um, there was a question that came in prior to the presentation today about opinions with respect to HALO, and um, that person who asked the question may want to tune in to this upcoming webinar, which will address those issues. All right, so for today, our agenda covers four topics. We're going to talk about apportionment. In the patent damages context, we're going to talk about extraterritorial issues. We'll then, third, talk about non-infringing alternatives. And finally, a, uh, a topic uh, called profit splitting. So let me first start off with apportionment. I'm going to handle that. And then Danielle will take the middle two. And then I'll take the last one, profit splitting. Um, so apportionment, if, if, if some of you tuned in last year about this time, uh, Danielle and I did a webinar. Um, on apportionment, we've done them before that even, and we talked to, kind of gathered cases together and talked about uh, different theories of apportionment and how they worked. And we're going to update that that research today. So um, uh, there will be a little bit of a repeat of last year, but we're gonna, we're going to talk about how these these theories have played out in the past uh, in the past year plus since we last presented. Um, just a reminder, um, on apportionment, uh, what the case law says is it's not exact, and you don't need to be exact. You should understand that the Federal Circuit has said that they never re have never required absolute precision and understand that apportionment, like other parts of damages, um, will lend themselves to approximation and some degree of uncertainty. So as a, you know, a litigant on either side of the V, you were going to want to uh, you know, recognize that it's not exact, it's not perfect, but you're going to want to get as good as you can. And some suggestions on how to do that um, would be you know, triangulating, we call it, triangulating in on a particular point or range. You can use, in this instance, you know, multiple different apportionment methods and say they all land at about the same spot. You can also check your work with apportionment. You can use, for example, license agreements to uh, assert through the expert or through fact witnesses that your apportionment um, result is, is valid and acceptable and reliable. All right, and so another practice pointer for apportionment is in today's world, because the uh, federal circuit and district courts have cracked down pretty significantly on the rigor that's required for a damages expert, for damages theory to get before the trial, or, I'm sorry, before the jury, that um, Today's patent damages expert will rely on other people. Um, we talk about expert witness piggybacking here. This was um, actually discussed in the Apple v. Motorola case from the Federal Circuit, noting that experts routinely rely upon other experts. Um, and so in this instance, for damages experts, almost without fail in today's world, your damages expert will rely uh, on your technical expert for certain issues, for example, apportionment. Um, the damages expert may also rely pretty heavily, in fact, on fact witnesses from both sides of the V. It could be 
uh, your, uh, you know, the, the, the fact witnesses, engineers, technical people from your team. It could be testimony that came in from the other side that they may use. So all of these things are, are valid pieces of information and, and really important to use in today's world of damages. All right, so let's talk about the next slide here. This is going to, towards what I talked about just a minute ago in, in this kind of research and analysis that we did last year that we've since updated. Um, what we did was we looked through, I don't know how many, over 100, maybe even approaching 150 different cases um, that involved apportionment. Um, we've updated it. The problem is, as you, if you look at these damages opinions on Daubert and motions in Limine, for example, Many times there's no visibility into the methodology. They're short and sweet. You can't really tell what happened. So a lot of the cases we reviewed didn't reveal any kind of detail about the apportionment that we could actually summarize and, 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 and put into our, our conclusions here. But we did find a lot of cases that did address apportionment in a, um, in a detailed, sufficiently detailed manner to give some, some guidance on what works and what hasn't worked. So we've got a few different methods here that we've accumulated, some new ones since last year. This is one that we talked about last year with a lot more results now. You can see here um, we have this first method. We call it feature counting, isolating the patented feature. Uh, surveys are a common way of doing this. For example, you have a product, and let's say it has six main features, one of which is patented. The idea here is to say how much is that one feature worth in terms of the overall product. And so a lot of cases have addressed this. They've done it through surveys, as I mentioned. They've also done it by looking at marketing documents, for example, from the defendant, which talks about the important features. And if the patented feature is one of those, those documents can be used in this type of analysis. We found in this instance, it looks like we've got, what, 10, 18 different cases. Six times this failed, so it was doubted out, this type of apportionment. Four times we found provisional failures where a do-over was allowed. The judge said, well, I don't believe that your apportionment methodology here of feature counting is reliable, but I'm going to let you go back and do it again and come back and let me know, and we'll see if it is acceptable. And eight times, you know, nearly half the times it got through. Some of the things to take away from this, straight-up division is going to be a problem. If you have six features, one of which is patented, and you just say it's one-sixth without looking at the relative importance of the feature, to determine you know, how significant it is vis-a-vis -vis the others, you'll probably run into troubles in a Daubert scenario. Um, you know, you want to look at the relative importance. Like we talked about surveys. That's one way to do it. You could survey customers to see how much they value the various features. A technical expert could get involved. Here's where the defendant's documents may become important. Even third-party market research can help you. And you could even look at all these different sources of information, combine them, tri triangulate them to come up with an apportionment that makes sense and is reliable. Um, a question here that we're just raising, um, we won't get into it in detail here, is do you have to apportion out non-patent attributes? For example, the value of the brand, the reputation of the product, et cetera. That's something to think about. All right, so moving on to the second method that we identified from the cases, this is something we've called related product comparison. You're going to see here that this worked every time. Um, an example from the Federal Circuit is Apple v. Motorola. In that case, they were trying to get a sense of what the value it was of some gestures um, applied, in, an, like, for example, in an iPhone context. And there was a, 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 a mouse pad that allowed gestures to be performed, and there was some data concerning how that particular the gestures would value in terms of the mouse pad, and that was used as a proxy for valuing the you know the use of gestures on the particular phone. Um, so this has worked a lot of times. Um, in fact, we never found a case where it did not work. But you have to note it's got limited availability. You have to find a comparable product that does not have the patented feature and try to figure out what the patented feature would be worth on that particular uh, uh, comparable product. You have to get come up with a delta, isolate the value of the patented feature. It's tricky. It's hard to find the right kind of product. But when, it, uh, when you have the right scenario, as you see here, it's worked every time. Another method that we've identified, we, we call it the real estate approach. Um, think of this as um, it has particular applicability in, in um, integrated circuitry and software. But there's other areas you can imagine it would work. 
And so uh, in the context of software, you could count up the, the number of lines of code that are covered by the patent. You could, in the chip world, you could find out how much of the territory or real estate of the chip is covered by the patented feature. Um, and then say that's the apportionment, um, whatever percentage that is. Here you can see again, lots of success. Worked four out of four. One of those cases was a trade secret case. But again, you can't just um, you know just, just lay down a percentage and say it's 50% of the chip, so it's a 50% apportionment. Just adding up the percentages like that's going to be dangerous because you need to account for the relative value of the of the real estate. You know, if it's a if it's a feature that uh, covers a huge amount of the chip, but it's really you know nothing magical, and the magic is in other parts of the chip, that should be accounted for. You know, again, technical experts, fact witnesses can help here. Defendants' documents can help, um, and so this can't just be a real simple analysis. It needs to be done in in sufficient detail with rigor, and when it gets done like that, it's tended to work. The fourth approach that we looked at, um, this one is called forward citation analysis. Um, you see it working here in two out of four cases that we found. What you do in this instance is you look at the patent in question, the patent being asserted, and you look forward in time from the patent and find how many patents subsequent to it have cited the patented issue. And the more times it's cited, the more valuable it is, is the theory. Um, you know, it doesn't always work because um, you have to justify how patent families are counted. You've got to account for the age of the patent. Um, you can, you know, try to do a check among technologically superior, similar patents. So, I mean, the, the, the word to the wise is don't just count up the number and say, gosh, it's, you know, X and therefore it's a lot and it's valuable. You need to think about the, the qualitative aspect of those citations. How old is your patent? Is it being cited by patents in the same family as it's in? and that's inflating the numbers. These things need to be accounted for. If it's done right, courts have accepted it. Fifth approach we looked at, extensive extent of use. This is where you evaluate the uh, portion of success of uh, the particular product or lack of success that's attributable to the patent. We have an example here of a malware blocking um, product and the percentage, percentage of the actual malware blocked by the patent was, was asserted as being an indicator of the apportioned value. Here uh, we found five cases, three out of five it worked. Real important here to note that actually this extent of use approach can be applied by either side. The plaintiff could say it's used a lot, therefore uh, my patent's very valuable. The defense could say this is uh, almost never used or um, you know the, the, the customers never turn it on or it's a feature that's only on for a split second and then it's off the rest of the time. So you can imagine this is the type of an apportionment approach that can come from either direction. Um, one note we have here, one court noted that this worked for the plaintiff because the use um, value of the infringing part was related to its contribution to the total value. That again is this malware case. The, the functionality of the patent was a primary function and so the plaintiff was successfully used that to get a higher level of apportionment. Another method that we've seen, this is pretty narrowly uh, usable method. Um, primarily, you'll see it pop up in the standards essential world. Uh, it's called the top-down approach. Um, what you're trying to do is look at a, a body of patents covering a product um, or a technology, and you determine the maximum royalty burden for all those patents. For example, all the standards essential patents that cover a standard. And then you divide among all those, those patents and account for the relative value of those that are being asserted. Um, we've seen the top-down approach applied in two standards cases. It worked half the time, one out of two. Um, some highlights to take away from this, you have to have verifiable data points. Um, you, know, you have to know just how many patents there really are in the pool. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know exactly how many patents are in a standard. You could have uh, disclosures by uh, companies in the standard that say, I have patents that cover it and don't tell you which ones they are or how many. Um, you can have you know, other instances where it's not precise. You may have third parties that don't actually disclose their essential patents to the standard. So, so these things need to be carefully evaluated. Um, you can't just consider patent, the number of patents, uh, I'm sorry, you have to consider the number of patents not the number of companies where this failed 
was a scenario where uh, the the proponent was saying there's uh, you know X number of companies that have patents, and you know our company, the plaintiff, is one of ten, for example, and therefore it should be one tenth the value. That did not work. It should be focused on the number of patents covering the particular technology or the standard. And lastly here, you need to consider differences in the value between the patents. Um, you know, some standards patents or patents in a pool covering a particular technology are more valuable than others. And there's a rule that uh, was applied in the Innovatio standards case that some of you may be aware of. Um, a rule that was uh, first, uh, well, I don't know if it was first, but it was advocated by an economist saying that 10% of patents make up 84% of the value of the technology. That was applied in Innovatio, and, 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 the, and the plaintiff there was able to establish that their patents fell in this 10% this side of things and were more valuable than others. And of course, you know, if you're asserting patents in a, in a standards world, a lot of patents in the standards body will not have actually been proven to be essential. And so the ones asserted, if you've proven that they're essential, that they're infringed, then they would, it would it stand to reason they have more value than those that have not been proven essential. Last approach I want to talk about here is the one that I've never seen work, it's, uh, and I've seen it tried twice. Um, it's blaming the defendant. What does that mean? Um, the defendant didn't give us enough information to prove apportionment, therefore we shouldn't have to apportion, or therefore we can estimate in a, uh, you know, without a rigorous application of economic principles or technical principles. And you can imagine that that's not going to work. Um, the burden of proof is on the patentee. And that's what the courts have said. And if, if you're going to apportion and you want to, you need to apportion, you, you have to get the evidence, you have to take the discovery, and you have to have a position on it. You can't blame the defendant for stonewalling. All right, and with that, I, I'm done with the apportionment section. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle to talk about extraterritoriality. Thanks, Chris. It may uh, not be a surprise to anyone that the key cases around this issue still are power integrations, HALO, Western GECO, and the Marvell case. Uh, HALO and Western GECO, in cases that are cited here, are actually the Federal Circuit opinions uh, issued after remand. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about those. But uh, as much time as has passed since the last time we talked about this issue in this forum, not much has been clarified across, uh, across the courts, federal circuit, district courts, or, or otherwise. Some folks on this call may be aware that the Supreme Court has taken up the Life Tech case. And while that's not a 271A uh, issue, it does, uh, it does deal with 271 F, uh, what is uh, an F1 to be exact? And what, what will be interesting to hear uh, at the oral argument, which is scheduled for next week, uh, December 6th, is exactly what the Supreme Court is going to be interested in. Are they going to be looking for a strict standard or trying to loosen any strict standards that the Federal Circuit may be applying uh, or have applied in this particular instance. But what's interesting in life tech is that you've got a situation where Promega was the exclusive licensee of a patent. It was a kit for genetic testing with multiple components. Life tech was one of its competitors and admitted to making and selling and selling kits. Uh, one component of the life tech kits was made in the United States and then shipped to a foreign manufacturing site for assembly. The kits were sold worldwide, and it was there was no dispute that the sales in the United States constituted infringement under Section 271. Uh, the jury in the at the district court level went on to award Promega damages for sales outside the United States on the theory that the foreign sales constituted infringement under Section 271 F1. And F1 says that if you're sending supplies uh, 
from the United States or sending components from the United States uh, where such components are uncombined in whole or in part in such a matter as to actively induce the combination of such components outside the United States in a manner that would infringe the patent if the combination occurred inside the United States, then you're liable as an infringer. So Promega, the jury awarded damages to Promega, excuse me, awarded damages for sales. The district court said that Promega failed to prove infringement and so vacated that part of the, of the jury verdict and of course Promega appealed. And the Federal Circuit said, uh, well, uh, life tax actions um, could constitute infringement. Uh, which creates liability for, for worldwide uh, sales, and then went on to say that, yes, a single component can be a substantial portion, and in this particular case, it was because the component that was being supplied was, was the one thing that uh, w it was important because the kit was inoperable without it. So the Supreme Court, the question before the court is, whether the Federal Circuit erred in holding that supplying a single commodity component of a multi-component product from the United States is infringing, exposing the manufacturer to liability for all worldwide sales. So it'll be interesting to see what the oral argument is next week and then also to, to see how the Supreme Court comes down on that. But let's go back to HALO and Western GECO and starting Starting with HALO, some of you may remember uh, in HALO, those, that was a competitor situation as well. Uh, HALO uh, HALO sued uh, Pulse for infringement. Uh, Pulse uh, had an agreement with Cisco. Uh, some of the events that led to the agreement with Cisco occurred inside the United States and some occurred outside the United States. So for example, price negotiation, final price approval, marketing meetings, samples, sales meetings, and design meetings all occurred inside the United States. The manufacturer, the sales, the invoicing, and the shipping of the uh, infringing product occurred outside the United States. So on remand, the Federal Circuit looked again at was there a sale and, and came to the conclusion that, that sales, When all, when all substantial activities of a sales transaction, including the final formation, occur inside the United States, excuse me, occur outside the United States, the fact that there are pricing and contracting negotiations within the United States aren't going to convert that transaction into something that falls over, falls under 271A. And so here the court on remand acknowledges that HALO presented evidence about pricing negotiations and certain contracting and marketing activities that led to the ultimate purchase orders, um, at purchase orders and sales overseas, but that couldn't convert, those facts alone couldn't convert uh, the sales into something that would fall under 271A. And when we look at the, the offer for sale, the, remit, uh, the HALO court also came to the conclusion that, based on prior case law, that if, if there's going to be an offer to sale, excuse me, an offer for sale, for it to be infringement, it's got to be an offer that contemplates the sale inside the United States. And the evidence in the HALO case was that the offers for sale contemplated sales outside the United States. And so it would not fall under Section 271A. In Western GECO, I just want to point out, uh, point out the dissent. In the majority opinion, uh, the majority said that they did not need to address uh, the question of, um, of foreign sales. Uh, but the dissent took the opportunity to say, 
we have unresolved issues here, uh, and we should take the opportunity to address them. And the primary thing that the dissent points to is that when we have a patent owner who demonstrates patent infringement under the United States law and foreign lost profits, what degree of connection do we have to have between the two before the foreign activity can be used to, man it to, to measure the damages? And some of you may have participated in our webinar uh, this time last year where Chris and I put together a list of, a list of factors of where, where is the contract, uh, where are the sales, where are all the events that lead up to the, to the, to the final transaction uh, both analyzing it both in terms of risk avoidance and also uh, trying to figure out what kind of discovery you would need in, in your particular case. And the dissent in Western GECO says exactly what we were talking about. Creative lawyers uh, can create a structure that insulates liability for their, for their clients. It doesn't change the economics of the transaction because the patent owner, patent owner is still not going to be able to be fully compensated for the infringement because of the structure that's put in place. But the dissent here lays it out and, and talks about it. And you, you can also apply this exact uh, question and, and concern to the, to the HALO case. There are a couple of district court cases where the issue of extraterritoriality has come up in the last year. The first is the M2M Solutions case out of the District of Delaware. Uh, this is interesting because here the plaintiff was saying that they were entitled to, uh, entitled to damages based on worldwide sales and did not do a comparison or estimate the portion that was sold outside the United States that then made its way back into the United States. And Judge Andrews said, well, you can't do that because it doesn't overcome the presumption against extraterritoriality. Uh, the plaintiff has, has, has the burden to prove that the accused product made abroad and shipped abroad actually made their way back into the United States. And then you, you can't just use all worldwide sales. You've got to actually get at some estimation of what those sales are that made their way back into the United States. So the court didn't just say, no, you can't do it. But Judge Andrews went on to say, here is what I would expect to see. One is evidence allowing a jury to determine how many products sold abroad made their way back into the U.S. And he suggests that you will take third-party discovery to get this information uh, from, the, from the customers of the, of the defendant in this particular case. And then you would have a, a data-backed estimate of what that would look like. And this is exactly what uh, the evidence was presented in the HALO case at the district court. Some of you may, may remember this, but the, the plaintiff went through uh, through and showed the sales that were in the United States and then also estimated what the sales were outside the United States that ultimately made their way back into the United States. And while the defendant and the defendant's customers didn't actually have that sales data, uh, the damages expert was able to estimate it based on publicly available information through, um, through SEC filings and things like that of what the percentage of the sales were worldwide versus the United States and, and come up with some information and the court allowed that allowed that testimony in because based on the evidence that was available, it was credible evidence to present to the jury. So here Judge Andrews is suggesting to the plaintiff that they do just that. Uh, and in fact, uh, the plaintiff had information available to it about sales from one of the defendant's largest customers that were coming into the United States, but they made no attempt to use that to extrapolate what the total number of the worldwide sales that may have entered it back into the United States could have been, excuse me, the foreign sales that had come back in. If you are in uh, New York and New Jersey, the CLA, CLE code is... The second case I wanted to point out is the GE Healthcare versus BioRad 
laboratory from the Southern District of New York. Here, uh, the plaintiff was seeking uh, sales information uh, from, from the defendant, specifically addressing the foreign sales of the accused product. And the defendant said that Federal Circuit precedent precludes this kind of discovery. Uh, and Judge Swain, in that particular case, said, no, it doesn't, because first of all, the Federal Circuit cases that you're relying on don't address the scope of discovery. And these cases don't hold, don't hold that the extraterritorial conduct is entirely irrelevant to the determination of damages arising from infringement committed in the United States. So here, the court con concluded that the defendant needed to turn over those sales because discovery of foreign sales information is not precluded by the presumption against extraterritoriality. So our next topic today is non-infringing alternatives. And that is, that is a, a mouthful. I have a jury consultant that I work with, and she uh, does not, uh, non-infringing alternatives is her least favorite theory to explain to a mock jury or to any jury. And as much as we try to go back and forth on it, I have not persuaded her yet that it is that it should be should be the best one. But in the when we look at what the cases are or what um, parties are doing at the district court level, the trend is uh, to argue that the non-infringing alternative uh, is a cap on damages. So whatever it costs to implement the non-infringing alternative, that should be the cap on what the plaintiff is entitled to um, to receive to receive uh, for infringement. Now, the Federal Circuit case law doesn't actually talk about non-infringing alternatives in that way. In this, you see here on the screen the quote from the, from the Mars case. And, and the Mars case says, look, you can't say that the royalty damages are capped at the cost of implementing the cheapest available acceptable non-infringing alternative because the accused infringer may be liable for damages, including a reasonable royalty, that exceeds what the accused infringer could have paid to avoid infringement. And we have, I'm sure a lot of us on, the, on this call have seen uh, motions for summary judgment or motions in limine or, or Daubert addressing um, this very issue. So you've got the, the plaintiff filing a motion to strike because uh, the defendant is saying that the cost of the non-infringing alternative should be a cap on damages, which is inconsistent with the language. But I want to point out in the M2M Solutions case uh, that we've already talked about, but from the District of Delaware, here the defendant filed a motion for summary judgment to limit damages to the cost uh, to implement the, the non-infringing alternative. Here, uh, the, the court had, had uh, excluded the plaintiff's experts, and so there was unrebutted expert testimony that the commercially accessible non-infringing alternative could be implemented for $60,000. Uh, so the defendant said, uh, because that's how much it could be implemented for, we should limit damages to $120,000. And there, there was no rhyme or reason, except I guess it's just a multiple of two, so it, it looks less shocking um, on, the, on the amount. Uh, and Judge Andrews said, uh, no, uh, I'm going to deny your motion. Uh, he relied on the Mars case and said that the Federal Circuit rejects the notion that uh, that non-infringing alternative is a cap. Judge Andrews said that it is a factor, and while it is a factor, it doesn't conclusively establish an upper limit on a reasonable royalty. And he pointed out that it's up to the jury to decide whether they believe the expert opinions on the acceptability and feasibility of the non-infringing alternative.
Chris and I talk a lot about the practicalities of the non-infringing alternative, and we like when we're on the defense side, we certainly like the number that that this uh, theory drives to. And then on the plaintiff side, we like it as well because there's a lot that has a jury appeal to it. And this this slide is is really what we think has the most jury jury appeal from the plaintiff side is why haven't you switched? If your non-infringing alternative is so great, why haven't you switched to it? Uh, you say it's cheaper and you say it's better, so why haven't you switched? And you've been telling the jury uh, all week long that it's available and acceptable, so if it's so available and so acceptable, why haven't you switched to it? And then as the jury is looking into the courtroom and seeing the number of lawyers who are, who are there and they're listening to us tell them that this case is, is about a, you know, whether it's a, a $60,000, $120,000, or a $2,000 non-infringing alternative, they're wondering why haven't you switched yet. So when, when we're on the defense side, we've got to drive to an answer to that question, why haven't you switched? Now, of course, if you have been able to switch and it's going swimmingly, then that then that's that's a whole different different circumstance. But a lot of times, when people when defendants are talking about non-infringing alternatives, they haven't actually switched. And so, trying to figure out how do we explain how do we explain that practicality uh, in the context of our jury trial. Uh, to these jurors who are only with us for a week to 10 days, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. When we, when we have presented this issue in, in, mock, in mock trials and jury trials and then talked with some of our, our friends who have had the same uh, theory presented at trial, what we come around to is we've got to present a solid, factual, common sense explanation for the non-infringing alternative. So it's, it's not our expert sitting up there on the stand saying, oh, I'm your damages expert and I know that it would only cost you know, $60,000 to implement this non-infringing alternative. I talked with the technical expert, you've already heard from that person, so we're done. You should just believe me. It's got to be uh, more deliberate with what it, what specifically is the non-infringing alternative, and how is it different from from what's accused? What are the pros and cons of it? Uh, and then, do the cons render the non-infringing alternative unacceptable? And so, someone in the trial is going to need to talk through the answers to those questions, uh, and some of that is going to have to come from a knowledgeable company employee. And that, that company employee is also going to have to be able to talk about what it would take to implement it, because those, so these things like the employee hours, the equipment, the process for implementation, and the timetable, those are all of the, those are some of the components that go into calculating what the cost of the implementation is. So the, the $60,000 as the, the District of Delaware, Delaware case has. But here, it, if we're going to rely on this particular theory at trial, it's got to have a story, and we've got to have storytellers, and it can't just be our expert witness. So I borrowed, I borrowed Chris's piggyback picture uh, for, for this. So, so the, the three components or three, three type categories of witnesses are going to be the expert witnesses, the lay witness opinion folks, and then the fact witnesses. And the lay witness opinion and the fact witnesses may, um, be, the, may be the same person, but it's going to be important to present a a uh, consistent uh, trial story through all three of these um, all three of these components. So just 
just a couple of examples with these with these cases. So the the core wireless case uh, just last month uh, denied the court denied a plaintiff's Daubert motion. Uh, the plaintiff was trying to strike the damages expert, the excuse me, the non infringement non infringing alternative theory that the damages expert was presenting solely because the damages expert was relying on the technical expert. So as we know from other case law, that is standard operating procedure uh, in, in patent infringement cases, and that is particularly true with non-infringing alternatives. It is the rare case that the damages expert would be in a position to talk, to talk, um, to talk about the technical aspects that would make the non-infringing alternative, in fact, an alternative and also non-infringing. The second is the I wanted to point out is that the EMC case, EMC versus Pure Storage from the District of, of Delaware, there uh, the defendant's damages expert uh, was relying on technical experts. Uh, she was also relying on the chief product architect for, for Pure Storage. Uh, and some of the things that the chief architect was telling her were some of the things that he was sharing with her. Uh, both in a in a um, in a deposit in his deposition testimony as well as in interviews was was this is what we're implementing working to implement right now. Uh, he gave his opinion about the feasibility of the non-infringing alternative uh, as well as the time frame for the implementation of the non-infringing alternative. And so while uh, and the court said it's okay uh, for the damages expert to rely on the chief product architect because he satisfies the Rule 701 requirements uh, of possessing specialized knowledge and experience germane to his opinions about the feasibility and timing. So uh, it it takes it in that particular circumstance the someone who may have, who could have just been relegated to a fact witness level was elevated to a lay witness level because they they excuse me a lay witness opinion level because they were able to find someone with a specialized expertise um, who was the right person from the company to be able to tell the story and then also give opinions about the non-infringing alternative And then lastly, even if we have the right experts and the right lay, uh, lay opinions and the right fact witnesses, the non-infringing alternative theory has to fit with your overall trial theme. And that's something that Chris and I have talked about uh, in all of our presentations is that when you go, when you, when you get to the expert stage, you have more than one theory uh, in discovery, but when you get to the trial stage, you may only go with one or two. Uh, and it may be that you've got your, non your non-infringing alternative theory ready to go, but it just doesn't fit with the overall trial theme. And, and that's okay. Uh, there are other ways to get to the to get to um, to drive to a lower damages number, uh, because there are risks associated with the non-infringing alternative theory. The other thing is, if you are going to present it, you've got to make time to present it. I know some of us have been in jurisdictions where each side has 12 hours, and somehow or another, the damage the defense damages expert is the last witness, and that person has 30 minutes to get through everything. Well, that if you're going to present a non-infringing alternative theory at trial, we've got to be more deliberate with the time that we spend with that particular expert as well as the other witnesses that come before the expert uh, to make sure that the jury understands what's being presented. All right, so with that, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you for profit sharing, splitting. Thanks, Danielle. All right, well, let's talk about profit splitting in the context of patent damages. Um, here's a 
pretty simple example scenario. How do you visualize it? Like the hamburger versus the cheeseburger. The, the unpatented hamburger and, and the, uh, the you know the plaintiff gets a, a patent on on the cheese aspect of it, and so we look at what the cost of the hamburger and the profit from that hamburger is vis-a-vis -vis the cheeseburger and its profits, and we find there's a surplus profit of thirty cents. Um, and the question becomes, what portion of that surplus profit from the patent invention should go to the uh, should go to the plaintiff, and what portion should go to the defendant? That's what this is all about. And this arises in these scenarios where you could zero in on the value of the apportioned feature. So we go back to apportionment. Once we apportion out the patented feature, then we figure out who gets what. Um, it also pops up fairly regularly in the context of cost savings and revenue enhancement cases. So where there is some some fairly old precedent that relates to doing this. Um, you can see the TWM case back from um, 1986. And there, the uh, the case had um, laid out the, a new approach to damages at that time, anyway, as far as I know, called the analytical approach. And the court said, "Well, you don't need to do Georgia Pacific. There's other ways you can do this." And 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 the analytical approach is one of them, in which you look at the projected profitability um, before the you know, the actual sales of the infringing product begin, and you figure out what profit is attributable to the patent, and then split it. There's other precedent from the Federal Circuit, this Finjan case from 2010, and you know, damages is moving so fast, I almost consider Finjan to be a relatively old case at this point. So six years ago, the Federal Circuit um, upheld a, a profit split by an expert named Parr, where uh, he had done a one-third, two-third split, and um, the, the, the uh, defendant had argued it was arbitrary, and the court said that that was unpersuasive and cited the uh, analytical work that, that this expert had done looking at the custom in the industry, history of prior licenses, competitiveness, importance of the patented technology, a bunch of factors in coming up with this one-third, two-thirds. So there's precedent in the courts and the Federal Circuit has accepted profit splitting and the question is how do you do it? Well, one way that was getting some traction for a while and it's not getting traction anymore as we'll see in a minute was the Nash bargaining solution. And this was uh, an economic game theory uh, originated by John Nash. He's a Princeton math professor who I'm sure many people have heard of. Um, and he he actually won the Nobel Prize not for this Nash bargaining solution but for some other work. And they made a movie about him called A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, a very good movie. And so John Nash came up with this concept of the Nash bargaining solution which leads to a splitting of profits. But as we we'll see, it's not something that um, is, you know, it's not foreclosed by the Federal Circuit, but it certainly has uh, taken a serious ding in a recent case, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The goal here is to achieve something called Nash equilibrium, and you have um, you know a game consisting of multiple players. In our world, it's going to be usually two, plaintiff and defendant. They're bargaining for a deal, and each has a bunch of choices and strategy. And Nash equilibrium says that those, those strategies are achieved, um, I'm sorry, the equilibrium is achieved when the strategies are mutually in reinforcing. And you can imagine if you're mutually reinforcing across the table plaintiff defendant, then you'll typically wind up with saying we each get half. And that's kind of the root of the problem with, with Nash. So in a patent case, a little bit more specifically, plaintiff and defendant are the two bargaining. They're trying to figure out you know, who gets what of this surplus and you're going to split it. And the true, equi true equilibrium will result in a 50-50 split because that's the best possible outcome for both. I'm buying a car. The dealer wants to sell it to me for 20000 I want to buy it for eighteen. We wind up at nineteen. That's the idea. So what happened was you know, typical plaintiffs would typically argue for a 50-50 split. Um, it is true that you can, can that, that Nash Bargaining, NBS, it's abbreviated here, Nash Bargaining Solution, allows for consideration of the relative bargaining power, but, but typically you'd see people advocating a 50-50 split, this best possible outcome. Well, that was a problem for Judge Alsop in the Oracle v. Google case in 2011. He first um, observed that this, this concept violated the Unilock 25% rule, stating that it would, it would invite a miscarriage of justice by clothing a 50% assumption in an impenetrable facade of mathematics. Uh, he went on to say that it wasn't acceptable in, 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 in a particular case there. It had never been approved by a judge at that point in time from his research. Um, 
despite the fact it had been lurking for decades in the field of economics. And he also observed that it was a theory that a plaintiff would love because it awards fully half the surplus to the patent owner, which in most cases will be half the infringer's profit, which is many times the real world royalty rates. Well, after the Oracle case, and actually up to um, the next case we're going to look at, there was a, a fair amount of activity in the courts and Dalberts and Mills concerning Nash, and, and it was going both ways. Some courts accepted it, others rejected it, and um, we then wound up with the Vernetics case uh, from 2014 in uh, the Federal Circuit. And in this case, the, the, you know, the Nash theorem came up to the Federal Circuit and they were forced to consider whether it was reliable and usable in a patent situation. And what, he, what they observed was that Nash has a certain set of premises that have to be uh, satisfied, but it doesn't say anything about what, the, um, you know, what kinds of situations fit the premises. So if you're going to seek to invoke the Nash bargaining solution in a particular situation, you have to show that it fits. Because otherwise, you're going to end up um, you know, with this 50-50 split without any kind of a demonstration that the premises underlying the theorem should apply. So the court observed, kind of, you can see the second bullet here, that, they, that it agreed with courts that have rejected invocations of Nash without sufficiently establishing that the premises of the theorem actually apply to the facts of the case at hand. And so while the Federal Circuit in Vernetics did not kill Nash bargaining outright, it certainly wounded it pretty severely. And in that particular instance, they observed that the, the expert for the plane, if it started at a 50-50 split without applying the premises, so it was like a 25% rule kind of concept, just start there. Don't it, it, and they, they held that it, it, there would have been not enough to establish that the premises applied. And then that expert actually did a little bit of a modification of the 50-50 by considering relative bargaining power, arrived at 45-55, but that wasn't good enough. So what now? What, what, what can we do in to, to profit split in a way that you can get, uh, you know, it's acceptable for the courts? Well, according to Vernetics, you have to have a model that fits the circumstances of your case. And, and one option that's cropped up in a few cases is the rubenstein Mathu bargaining model which uh, is the foundations and the work of two um, professors, Dr. Rubenstein in Jerusalem, Hebrew University, and Dr. Mathieu in the University of Essex. And their bargaining model is an economic negotiation model. Um, you have parties making an offer, either accepted or counteroffered, and it goes back and forth until a deal is made. The difference between their two theories is that Dr. Rubenstein his theory allows the time to pass between the offers, whereas Dr. Mathieu solves the, par the model or the bargaining concept as the time approaches zero. And that can be significant for the uh, hypothetical negotiation because, as we all know, that's supposed to occur on the eve of infringement. The parties sit down at the table. They would make a deal quickly. So the Mathieu concept of uh, the time approaching zero seems like a pretty good fit for the uh, Georgia-Pacific hypothetical negotiation context. Well, so what are some of the principles and assumptions underlying the bargaining model? Well, first, and importantly, unlike Nash, there's no 50-50 starting point. There's no assumption that the sides are, you know, have equal negotiating strength. So in other words, this equilibrium where both sides get the best outcome means 50-50. That's not part of the deal here. Um, the, the model has a, you know, kind of relies on the inclusion of party-specific and time-specific facts and information. In other words, it goes back to the principle from the Federal Circuit says make it fit. Um, and, and what you do, and one of the things you do is you consider the relative cost of capital or discount rates for each party to the negotiation, and this becomes a proxy for their relative strength in making a deal. In other words, this last bullet means that whoever can borrow at a better rate will enjoy greater bargaining power. So you're actually looking at the specifics of the parties, you're looking at their power to get good deals, and you're, uh, according to this model, you're then balancing the split between their relative powers um, using this uh, cost of capital and discounts and in, in borrowing as, as a mechanism for doing that. So how is it party specific? You know, we talked about this a little bit before. You tie the cost of the capital discount rate to the specific parties at the bargaining table. Well, how do you do that? Well, one way you can do it, you can go to industry standard publications and you can get data for particular industries and data for comparable companies 
examples would be Ibbotson, Duff and Phelps, Bloomberg. They all have um, specific kind of industry specific. Um, they talk about different companies that you can see to get comparables um, to the to the parties that are at issue. You can also just take discovery from from both sides, you know, from from your client and from the other side, and you can figure out what the actual borrowing rates are, what their debts like, what their bank loans are. Look at their balance sheets, income statements. All this can give you a sense of what their um, cost of capital and their discount rates would be. And then from that, you determine the party's weighted average cost of capital or WAC, and giving you party-specific information about their bargaining power. The time specificity comes from the fact that you use data from around the date of the hypothetical negotiation. So you go to, you know, if it's 2006, you go to Ibbotson's for 2006. You take discovery from the from the parties or get get information from your own client concerning their you know, their rates and their balance sheets, et cetera, et cetera, from around the time of the hypothetical negotiation. So you're tying the model to the specific facts. Well, it has come up in a couple of cases. Um, you can see here in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, Judge Gilstrap in the Content Guard, the Amazon case found that the Rubenstein model in that particular instance, um, that the, the plaintiff had articulated each premise of the model and cited the specific evidence to support it, and here said use defendant-specific evidence as inputs. So in that instance, it was approved. Flip it around, excluded, in the Omega Patents v. Cal Calamp case from the Middle District of Florida, um, in that case, the plaintiff was a single-person, non-practicing entity, didn't have any financial records. There was nothing you, know, you can find a comparable in an Ibbotson's or something like that um, in order to tailor the whack to the, the plaintiff's particular situation. And so without having that information specific to the plaintiff in order to get a weighted average cost of capital, in a way to figure out who's got the bargaining power relative to one another, then um, it just didn't work for this particular court. So another point here that's worth mentioning is that, as we probably all know, in, in the Daubert case, the Supreme Court said that you know, one thing that you can look to, one piece of evidence you can look to, to establish the reliability of a scientific theory is whether it's been published in peer-reviewed literature. In this particular instance, um, Dr. Mathieu published a, a paper in 2006 where he applied the, the bargaining theory to a copyright context, and even in particular to negotiations including reasonable royalty. Um, and so this is a, you know, a paper that could be cited to support the reliability of this, this particular bargaining model for, for the IP, for the hypothetical negotiation to get over a Daubert challenge. And then you know, also a uh, paper by Dr. McDuff from Les Nouvelles um, describing this model. And Les Nouvelles is peer-reviewed. It's one of the preeminent licensing um, journals in the world. So what are some final thoughts on profit splitting? Um, you can combine a profit split with other approaches. We talked before about you know apportionment, triangulate, check, do all those good things. The more you can check, the more you can, can offer alternative theories, the better off you'll be and the more Daubert-proof you'll be. Um, and so, you know, these are things you might want to do in combining profit splitting with other theories. So that's all I've got on, uh, on profit splitting. Um, there's a couple of questions here that are, uh, have popped up as we've been going. Um, there's a, a question about how you, can, how you can get access to the slides. Uh, I think you can go to the Fish and Richardson website. We have a, uh, a page on these webinars. You can get access to the slides. You can also um, obtain a, uh, a, a recording of the particular uh, of this of this presentation. All right, and I think that's all we've got in terms of questions. Um, thank you very very much for joining us. Thanks Danielle for for your great presentation, and we really appreciate everybody you know, listening in. And and uh, as we said before. If you have questions offline, if you want to call us or email us, we're happy to take those calls. Thank you very much.